Will you help me welcome my wife, Pastor Veronica, to the stage? Come on, guys, give it up. So excited. She's going to be bringing the word today. And, and, and she, ins she inspires and influences so many, not just in our congregation here at Discovery, but women all over this, this city and state. And I think that it, before you get into uh, you know, the message, Veronica, if there's any women out here that, that they look at your life and they see how, how you are so nurturing and mothering, not just to our kids and as a wife, and to so many you're a spiritual mom too, but then they see how much you make a difference in the impact you're making. And if any woman that is here today and is thinking, how can I, how do I make a difference? And they're inspired by your life. What advice would you give to any woman that says, I want to make a difference with my life? Well, first of all, it's not me. So Amen. you were way too kind. Amen. Um, it's Jesus, right? It's yeah. Jesus, like we just sang about. It's him. He set this captive free, and that's what, you know, yeah. we have to put Jesus first. But I would say that, you know, when I when you asked me the first service, um, right before we had to kind of like, you know, ask me this question, and I thought about three women in the Bible. And I thought about Mary, Ruth, and Esther. And I thought about how Mary was called to do something, right? And she knew what her calling was and how her calling was attached to Jesus. Yeah. And she, what she was called to do was to come under authority and to really walk out her calling with someone. And so one of the things that, um, one of the books that we love, and we, we just recently read, is called Undercover, and it's a great book. So if you're out there and you want to step you know, into your calling, into ministry in some way, into, you know, giving, serving in any way, I would read that book. I would recommend Undercover by John Bevere. And then the, the second story with Esther is that, or with Ruth, Ruth was called to walk out this life. She was called to be the great example um, in the Bible of mentoring and loving and serving Naomi and serving her mother-in-law. If she would have went around and gossiped about Naomi, she would have never been in the Bible. If she would have went around and not been under the cover of Naomi and really said, God, whatever you have for me with this person, or even Esther, if Mordecai, her uncle, wouldn't have been the one pushing her and kind of a part of her story and her calling, if she would have been like, Mordecai, you're crazy. It's okay. We'll all perish together. I'll perish. You'll perish. Everyone's going to perish. I don't care. She wouldn't have been someone who have, would have done great things. And so I think that a part of serving is you might see me or other women out in the front and you think that it's really easy and it's just like taking charge but really it's actually submitting a lot Amen. it's submitting it's coming under the authority of my pastor coming to the authority of my leaders of the community leaders and saying like here i just want to serve i just want to fulfill the purpose god gave me i think what i hear you saying is is to live a life of honor right to honor to honor those right. around you and above you awesome Absolutely. can't wait for the word of god today we give it up one more time for pastor veronica <laughs> All right, all right. Welcome to Discovery. How's everyone doing? Good? No? You guys aren't good? Okay, good, good. Well, if you, it sounds like some of you were dragged here then. Were you dragged here by your mom today? Is that what happened? Dang it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, whether you were dragged here or drugged or whatever, um, or you're a faithful member, you're excited. I'm personally excited about the message today. It's about compassion. And compassion is something that's like my life message. And I'm really, really passionate about compassion, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, I, I love that God is called the father of compassion and that it's something that, that moves me to my core. It really is my life message. So let's read our first scripture. Our scripture comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. When I was growing up, um, many of you don't know this about me, but when I was growing up, from the time I was about four till I was about 17, I had a stepfather that was an alcoholic, and at home was crazy. It was like intense at home. So being home wasn't my favorite place, and so there was a wonderful church across the street from my house, and that was my safe place. That was my refuge. And God taught me so much about compassion on myself and my family through the church. And so I love the church. I love this church. I love God's big church. I love the church because of what it did for me and because of what it can do for so many other people. 
And so it's not a religious thing, right? It's not because if we get to follow all these rules and we're going to post the Ten Commandments on the wall and things like that, we're not going to do that here. And I love what we get to do. Um, one of the scriptures that really is like, I just love it. It's Psalm 68 that says that he is a father to the fatherless, a defender of the widow, and that in his holy place that God sets a lonely in the, fam- of the lonely in families that he does. He gives the lonely families. And so in my church, when I was growing up, I had spiritual mamas. I had aunties. I had father figures. I had the grandmas who would do crazy funny stuff and be like, oh, that's funny. You could do that. Like, you know, I learned about grandmas and I learned about moms and how wise they can be. And I learned about fathers and how strong and wise they can be all through the church. And it was so beautiful. I love it. And I love them. Um, So um, when I was about 14 years old, I asked my uh, my first spiritual mom that I was dealing with something where I was lacking um, compassion, which I didn't understand at the time. And so one of the things she told me, and it's always stuck out to me, like forever and ever, I still think about it every day, is she said, Veronica, sometimes we walk around and it's like we have these glasses on. And we see people through these lenses. And we're, we're, absor- uh, we're observing and we're watching people and we're filtering people um, through our our experiences, through our pain, through our past, you know, through all of these things, and they're like, they're like filters, right? So that was her analogy back then, but my analogy to you today is our Instagram filters, right? We kind of filter our life through these Instagram filters. How many of you ever used an Instagram filter? Because first service, there was like five people, and I'm wondering. All right, okay. I'm a little bit better. How many of you have an Instagram Okay, better, better. Okay, I was really scared for service. Pastor Sean, it was scary because there was maybe like four people that had Instagram filters. So I was like, I got to throw this message out the window. No one understands the filter. Um, but, <laughs> but one of the things we do is we don't have compassion filters on. We, we don't know how to look at people with compassion because we don't even know how to carry or look through the lens or the filter of compassion. One of our first villains for today is Um, on why we don't have those compassion filters. One of the reasons why I believe for a while until I was about 14 didn't understand compassion, and that was because we don't, sorry, don't make me go, oh, you weren't giving compassion. So you weren't giving compassion. This is something that wasn't modeled for you like me. It's something that maybe we grew up in a home where there was lots of Um, structure or maybe a lot of rules or maybe there was a lot of correction happening or maybe you would say something right and they're like that's not how you say it how many of you have done that to someone come on by raise of hands right that's so messed up no just kidding (laughs) it's not messed up it's funny but but we do we we sometimes walk through um, a, a house or even like faith right sometimes we can grow up in a house where we're filled with faith like there's you know, great people who have gone before us and who are so faith-filled, but there's kind of that lack of love and tenderness and compassion. And so I love this, um, I love this scripture here in First uh, Corinthians 13, chapter 2. And I believe on your handout it says um, 13, 1, but just read up here, not in your notes. Um, it says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have the faith to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Isn't this so amazing? You can know all mysteries, like know a lot of stuff, like be really smart. (laughs) Be like one of those people that we sometimes esteem to be, someone who's so knowledgeable and so, so, you know, all knowing. And, And most of the time, it's a very admirable thing. Not many of us want to just be known for loving people. Am I right? Do I hear it? Amen? You guys, are, are you going to be a good crowd or are we going to be a rough crowd? Which one? Let's go. We're going to hear some amen? So let's hear amen. amen. Let's go. <laughs> so some of us, we, we would rather, right? We would rather, if we really were honest with ourselves right now, we would rather be modeled or be re, uh, known for what we know and how we carry ourselves and how well we're put together and how we can accomplish things and how we can know stuff. You know, all of us want to be Mr. and Mrs. Google. You know, we want to know stuff. And we want people to know we know stuff. But to be known just for being compassionate and loving, well, it's kind of weak, right? It's kind of soft, kind of not important. 
But it is. Because it says if you don't have those things, well, then you're just, you're nothing. And I think that some of us feel nothing. We feel meaningless. We try to fill our lives with pleasure, knowledge, you know, all those things, successes, even religious things. But then we still have this nothing feeling. We still feel kind of numb, kind of can't figure out what the problem is. And I believe that it's love. Um, Secondly here, on why we don't have, oh wait, sorry, let me back up real quick. I love what Pastor Jason says. I told him I would, ta- I would quote him today because he's awesome. Um, he usually says something that is really cool about this, is that he says, truth without love isn't truth. And love without truth isn't love. And that's something that I feel like he, he's mentioned before on Sundays, and it's something that resonates so true to my heart, and it should to all of us, is that if we are thinking we're just speaking this truth, but it's not with love, it's not really truth. It's really not. It's all just so meaningless. Okay, so second point here is why we live without or why we can't live with filters of compassion is we don't understand the suffering. We, um, if we're honest, we look at people kind of in the uh, um, homeless world, you can call it, I don't know what you would call it. So you see someone holding a cardboard sign or you see someone who is on the street and we kind of begin to pass judgment, right? Kind of guess why they are where they are. And so we don't understand why they're suffering. Like, why are they out there? Or how many of you have um, been driving down the street and you see someone talking to themselves and they're like really high or like on drugs in some way or like something's wrong? And they're like talking to themselves and you're just kind of like, do, 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 like, hmm, that guy's a little crazy. And then you just keep going, right? And, and it's just like you don't even understand why they're suffering so much that they are so out of whack and out of tune that people are just going by living their life while this person is suffering right in front of you. And we don't understand why. We don't care to understand why. We just, we just keep going. And so um, we filter people through our perspective and not their story. And everyone has a story. So in Luke chapter 7, there's this uh, Pharisee who invites Jesus over. And then, you know, they're chilling at home. They're, at, they're having like a great little time together. And then this woman comes in and she starts to cry at his feet at Jesus' feet, and she starts to wash his feet with her hair. You guys know the story, right? And she opens her oils, and she washes, and she's crying at his feet, which is such a beautiful, humble, amazing thing to imagine. If we had the opportunity to cry at Jesus' feet, how many of us would just rush the opportunity to fall at our Savior's feet? Well, the Pharisee, super great guy, he, uh, he, says, he says this in uh, Luke seven thirty nine. He says, when the Pharisee who had invited him in, who invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. This should make us mad, like super mad. It makes me mad that we can walk into a a church, a store, walk around anywhere, and what we do is we kind of size people up, like, okay, you're good not so good. Good enough for me to look at you and smile, not good enough for me to look at you and smile. And what this Pharisee did right here is he kind of just looked at the woman and said, this kind. He like generalized this entire population of a woman who was being humble, a woman who was broken and suffering. And instead of having an ounce of compassion, he wanted to label her and put her in a box. He wanted to make her feel less, make Jesus make make her feel less and not accept her and and not see the value in her suffering, not see what it was that she was suffering about. One of the things that, um, one of the quotes here is, we must learn, sorry, let's get that quote up. Okay. Uh, we must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or don't do, or I would even add have or not have, and more in the light of what they suffer. If we could understand that everyone today sitting in this room, everyone in front of you, people beside you, that we all suffer in some way, we all have a story. I think there's very very few of you, if any, that can say, I've had such a great life and I've never suffered. If you are in this room, please let me know who you are immediately because that would be wonderful (laughs) to know what happened to you. But all of us have a story. All of us have suffered and all of us 
could be, or some of us could be in a moment of suffering. And instead of feeling like we're judging the person sitting next to us by what they're wearing, what they do, or what they don't do, versus considering that the person who may be, be sitting next to you is suffering. Um, how many of you volunteer at the Dream Center? Let's give it up for our Dream Center. Yes, come on. So one of the rules that we have at the Dream Center, and it's one of my favorite things, um, it's kind of like an unspoken rule. We mention it every now and then. We don't have it in writing, but we should. But um, is that when you go out there, we don't take pictures of people in lines. Like you can't, you can't like go up and be like, oh, look at all those people suffering. Let me take a picture. You know, oh, look at all those people who, who don't have clothes and need food. Let me take a picture. And look at all these people. We don't do that. We don't do that. We have something where we say, if you really want to like highlight what we get to do, like you want to like promote it so that we can continue to do what we do and you know and, and highlight what what it is and get more people out there, then you get to go know someone's story. You go over, then you ask them a little bit about who they are, about what their life is, and and ask them their story, and then you can take a selfie with them and post it, because that's more important than just highlighting their suffering, and you don't know what in the world that person is going through. You don't know if you're taking a picture of someone serving his uncle or someone's mom. There could be someone coming to this church that we're feeding their family members on Saturday, and you're taking a picture of their suffering. All right, so we don't understand people's suffering. Another reason is we don't live with compassion is we don't know what to do with the brokenness. Amen? Amen. We don't know what to do. It's like, it's like so hard to like look at it and to know and ask the story. But then what do we do with the story? What do we do with it? And so a lot of us love this filter right here. <laughs> this is our favorite filter. This one's mine right now too because you don't have to have any makeup on and it just like smooths your skin and it like does the eyelashes and it's like your favorite filter, right? Amen to that one. Everyone's going to say amen. Okay, so this, <laughs> this one is, is like we want to see life all the time in this filter. We want to see everyone's story through this filter. We want everyone to be happy. Please don't be sad. Please don't be broken. Let's not look at that. Let's not worry about that. And so we don't really know why he has a scar on his chin. We don't want to be there when it happened. We definitely don't want to have a part of it. And we just want to look at everyone around us as if the perfect filter was always beautiful and on. And everything's rosy and happy because we don't know what to do if we find out. We don't know how to carry their burden and our burden and everyone's burden. How in the world do we have that much compassion? Ecclesiastes Chapter 3, verse 1 through 13 says, For everything there is a season, a time for everything, every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And he has made everything, all those things, beautiful, and it's time. Because even though when we don't enjoy looking at those broken things, he's working something beautiful out in those things. Even in the broken things, he's working something out. The Bible says that he is working good, for, good in every situation. Good for those who, who love him. He's working out good. It doesn't matter if it doesn't look good. Even if it is broken. Even if it's the season to pluck up or to don't kill, but says to kill, but don't kill. That's not. I'm not condoning killing. <laughs> no one should kill, but there might be a season for that. And, <laughs> and <laughs> there's a time to mourn, but we don't, you know, sometimes when people are mourning, we don't even know what to say, right? And even if you're mourning, you don't know what you want people to say. It's like, we don't know. We don't know what to do with this brokenness, but God says it's something beautiful, and he's working something beautiful out even when, even when it doesn't feel, even when it doesn't feel good. Um, another thing you guys might not know about me is that I used to work in social services, um, and um, a few um, months into my job, which, by the way, how many of you work in social services? A police officer, social worker, psychologist, therapist, teachers, all right, all right, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so some of you understand 
that sometimes there's those stories, those lives that we come across that just change everything. They like impact you so deeply that you're like forever changed because of that story. So I had a five-year-old and he was the cutest five-year-old. And my son, Caleb, was five at the time. And so there was a, a, there was a connection with him. Um, and we're gonna call him Dennis because he looked like Dennis the Menace. He was so cute. He had like a little cowlick and he was like, oh, he was so cute. And he didn't have any major like uh, behavioral problems. He was just like a boy and he liked to run and you know, run out of the yard, stuff like that, simple boy stuff. I mean, he honestly was better behaved than my son was at five years old. Um, but unfortunately, um, Dennis was already at his 18th home. And so when I got him on my caseload, um, the, what I kind of did was try to help prevent them from going to group homes. So Dennis was at risk of going into a group home, which you don't do that to a five-year-old normally. It's kind of illegal. And so they were like, you got to get him to stay on this home. So we're trying to get him to stay, but unfortunately that home didn't work out. And so over the weekend, while um, you know, we weren't working, uh, something really, 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 really awful happened to Dennis. Like, really bad. He was hurt um, severely. And it was, wasn't until Monday when I showed up to work that I found out what had happened to him over the weekend. And it was such a sad, hard thing to, to look at. It was um, looking at a broken five-year-old boy who should not have had that happen to him. And what I wanted to do was run to him and flee to Mexico. <laughs> Don't tell anyone that's my backup plan in case something ever happened. But that was a good plan at the time. I thought I need to go to him immediately, make this right, because sometimes when things are broken, you want to just fix it. You just need to fix it. You need, you need to just put the person in the car and drive away. Or if you have a teenager that's acting up, you just want to you know, tie him in the dungeon somewhere. And, and that's what you want to do. You want to fix it. And I couldn't fix, I couldn't fix it for him. I couldn't rescue him. I wasn't his mother. He didn't have a mother. He was on all of these homes and nowhere to go. And it was very hard to look at. So one of the reasons we don't live with compassion is we don't know what to do with the brokenness. And lastly is we don't have Jesus in the center of our life. We don't have any filters. We don't know where the effects gallery even is. I shouldn't say that word if that many of you didn't raise your hand about the filter. But the effects gallery is, just a lesson in Instagram today, is where you find all your filters, right? Raise your hand if you know what a uh, gallery is. Okay, let's go. Mostly women, let's go. <laughs> so it, it's like if you don't have Jesus at the center of your life, you don't have a compass. You don't have a guide. You don't have the effects gallery to even find where you would find the the compassion filter. It's like something is just missing. And we need to have Jesus there. First John 4 and 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Again, going back to just the whole idea that it's so much cooler to know everything. It's so much cooler to be so eloquent and smart than to be kind and ten tender and loving and compassionate. And we want to love God and we want to know him. And if he's not that for you, then that's the part that is missing in your compassion. Um, this is how we put Jesus at the center of the person, the problem, and the situation. And when we do that, we, when we put Jesus at the, at the center of the person, the problem, the situation, well, then we can look at people with compassion. So now let's talk uh, practically about how to live with compassion. Does that sound good? Amen? All right. So let's do that. Um, one of the things that I believe is really important and it's super easy is you would practice compassion in small doses of love. And all of the women say amen because we're going to give a great example to that for you. Um, one of the things that you know, we, we tend to do too, I think, is that we, we think when we're practicing compassion, we can practice it to certain types of people, right? So we kind of pick and choose, like, well, I can show compassion to pretty much everyone at my job because I have to, but when it, I come home and my spouse is there, I don't really have to show them compassion, right? 
and then or we pick and choose who we're going to show compassion to in large doses but when it comes to just the small things to everyone it's really really hard and so let's talk about just starting small just doing things that are small so first john 3 18 says let us stop just saying we love people let us really love them like for real and show it by our actions and we're gonna show it so we're gonna so for ourselves, so if you're one of those people and that first point was for you, that you grew up in a home and you don't even know how to be nice to yourself. You don't know how to be gracious or loving to yourself. Everything has to be like super perfect in your life. And there's so much pressure on you that you like, it spills over to other people and no one can have compassion. No one can have grace. No one can have mercy because you don't have it right here. Just like Joyce Meyer says, buy the shoes, eat the cupcake or something like that. I say do that for yourself. If you're a mom today, no one bought you a cupcake, go buy yourself a cupcake. You know, go go out and buy yourself a dress. If no one bought you a dress, go get the shoes. Go go eat whatever you want. You know, show yourself some love. And then, and most importantly, start talking to yourself better. You know, start looking in the mirror and seeing something without that filter. Start looking and seeing yourself with compassion. Start looking and seeing yourself how beautiful you are. And how amazing and called and, and, and wonderful the things are that God has for you. And not seeing yourself through this lack and this judgment. Um, or if um, someone closest to you is a problem, you know, like an annoying family member, which I know no one in this room has at all whatsoever, because I think I'm the only one. I'm just kidding. I love you guys. Um, <laughs> um, is that maybe we could start showing them compassion by the little things. Now, pick someone in your family that is the most annoying to you, the one that you struggle with giving compassion, and start with them. Because you can do it to everybody else very easily. But if you can start with just the little doses of picking that person that literally gets on your nerves, like when it's Christmas and they walk in, you're like, okay, I'm only going to be here for another 10 minutes, and then I'm leaving, and, and that, that person... Like, start showing them compassion. And I, I bet you some things are going to change. I bet you some things are going to change not only in them, but in your heart. It's going to be awesome. Um, and or, let's start serving at the Dream Center. Come on. We have food. We have clothing pantries. We have hotel outreaches. We have homeless outreach. We have all of these little things. And it's so amazing when you get to go out there and, again, kind of get to know people's stories and, and just to go out there and show compassion. There's something that changes in you. It's like it's like it's not about you. It's not even about like it's not like you are going to go do something amazing and, and, and give to someone like, oh, look at me. I'm going to go feed someone. It's going to be awesome. You live in your wrecks. You live in your like, whoa, I was I was fed more than I fed anyone. I was filled more than I, I, was, I was able to give out. I was giving. I was getting back so fast. Um, or serve on a dream team here on Sunday. And that's something that if you're here and you're like, I don't even have Jesus at the center, or maybe I kind of do, but I don't even know my purpose. I don't know what it is I'm supposed to do. Well, let me tell you, you have a purpose. You have a purpose. It's time to start taking action. God has called you. He's put gifts and, and talents and purpose in your hands. It's time for you to take action. Today is a great day. It's Mother's Day. Whatever day, tomorrow, Monday, just some days <laughs> are doing it. Start taking action and realizing that God has called you to something. So next week, actually, just a little commercial break, is track two. <laughs> and track two is all about discovering your purpose. And so if you don't know, it's really awesome. You get to find your spiritual gifts. You get to find, you know, what your, your personality is most like. You get to kind of figure out some things about who you are and where God has called you so that you can start doing those little things. Amen? Amen. Track two next week at 3.30. All right. Okay, so we're going to practice the small things. And then secondly, we're going to step into someone's story. So um, I want to challenge everyone. This is a really cool challenge. First service seems to do great. I think they're going to all go out and do it. Right now as we speak, they could be doing the challenge. I hope they are. Um, so one, one of the challenges that I wanted to do today is I wanted to challenge everyone that when you see someone who is homeless, that you would go up to them. And it's going to be great because they're probably going to have like 50 people go up to them, all the like regulars around here. Um, you go up to them, you ask them their story. Now, what you don't want to ask is, so how did you get here? 
Like what happened? Tell me. Can you, uh, that's not the question. You, what you want to ask is you want to say, like, tell me more about your life. Tell me, like, where are you from? Did you grow up in Bakersfield? Most of the time it's the answer is no. Um, you know, where, just tell me a little bit more about you. And I challenge you, Discovery Church, to go out there and to listen to someone's story. That person that you think might be dangerous uh, holding that sign, because they might be, I don't know. Um, or or <laughs> or that first, which you might need to sign a consent after, before taking the challenge. Um, but, you know, to go out there and to really <laughs> think, that was funny, huh? I like that one. <laughs> Ooh, that was a good one. A consent before the challenge. Um, <laughs> No, but we, but we do. We want you. We want you to go out there and to be something, do something dangerous, um, to go, <laughs> to go out there and to really just listen to their story, right? Like they have a story, they have something. They they might be honestly, there might be a parent. I don't know why. I just felt this in my heart. I didn't say this first service, but I feel it in my heart. There might be a parent sitting in this room today that has someone who's homeless, who is like, yes, please, please, Lord, send an army. Send an army to go ask. Please send someone to my son, to my daughter who is out there. There might be. You might be that person listening and saying, yes, please, Pastor Veronica, say that again. Because we, we, we could change the world if we just stopped. If we, could, we could do so much together if we just stopped to ask their story. Um, shortly after starting um, the Dream Center, one of my favorite people who would come around often, I, she was one of the first people I got to ask her her story. And um, usually when she comes up, Pastor Clarence Snow, she's like, where's Pastor Veronica? Where's Pastor Veronica? And, you know, she always wants to ask me for stuff because she knows that whatever she needs, she's going to get. Like, I love that girl so much. And she's going to get whatever she needs. If she wants five bags of food, we're going to give her five bags of food. You give her whatever she wants. We just love her so much. And so a few years ago when we, when we first started, I asked her her story because I wanted to know who, why are you in this state? What, you know, what happened? And so when I, of course, remember, I didn't ask her that. I just asked her a story. Um, but when I asked her, she said that at the age of 11 months old, just 11 months old, ev almost every day of her life, until she was able to run away from home at about 10, 11 years old, she was abused every way possible. Sexually, at 11 months old, mentally, physically, that she was given alcoholic drinks in her bottle at 11 months old. Not many of us in this room can say that. Not many of us in this room can identify to why she is smelly, can't hold a job, and out there always acting crazy. That is why. She doesn't have a drug problem. She doesn't have the lazy issue. She doesn't have some of the judgmental thoughts that we can add in there. She, her story is not your story. Her story is that she cannot pay a bill, like we can go to PG&E or log into a computer. She does not know how to do that. Because of the trauma, she's had mental delays, she's had physical delays, she's had emotional delays that does not allow her to function like we do. And we live in a broken society where there's not a place for someone to take care of her as she grows up. She kind of falls in this line between not severe enough to where she just gets lost in homelessness, which a lot of people fall into. So she'll come up and she'll be smelling and her hair's all grown down. I'm like, girl, this is a razor. This is how you do it. Okay, like this is a shower. Like you gotta be taking your shower, but what do you need? And she always wants blankets and she always, you know, I can't find my blanket. She wants a blanket. Give the woman a blanket. Let's love her the best that we can. And we love her well because we know her story. We love her more because we know her story. Now if everyone would see her come up, they would run from her for real. Like, she's a little scary sometimes, and she can be a little intimidating, but when you know her story, you're like, oh, I love that chick so much. Oh, I love her so much. And so it's important to know her story. And Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Again, it's fun and great to, to mourn, I mean, to rejoice. Trust me, I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I love rejoicing. It's super fun. If you guys have parties, invite me. I love parties invite me. You guys can look me up on social media. Um, <laughs> but I do. I, I love parties. And you all probably love parties, right? Um, but it's hard to mourn. If someone invited us over because 
they're suffering and they're hurting, it's like the last thing you really want to do. You're like, oh, you know, I really got this thing going on. Or can you just give me a quick text, right? How many of you love text before a phone call? You're like, no, please don't call me. Just send me a text. You know, <laughs> it's like we don't want to walk that process out. It's hard for us to really mourn with someone. And again, sometimes we don't even know how that looks like. Um, going back to my little Dennis the Menace. Um, so fast forward to, through all of his, all that trauma that he had to go through, unfortunately. Um, he was at his graduation ceremony. He was graduating from kindergarten. And um, it's, again, the same time as my Caleb. And it was so, it was, it was so God. It was so God. And so um, at the ceremony, all of the kids got to give um, the parents a like little necklace and they would call their name and they'd walk over and put the necklace on the parent. And so when it was his turn, there was myself and a few other social workers there for the graduation. And so we kind of just were like, oh no, what is he going to do? And he walks over and he puts it on my neck. And uh, whew, cannot cry again. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, to, to mourn with him in that space, like he didn't know how to mourn himself at five. But to just show up, to just like be in the room, to just be present, even in the suffering of people, is what God is telling us to do in Romans. He's telling us to rejoice, yeah, but then to mourn, to not just be like, okay, it's going to be okay, let me put the filter on it, everything's going to be beautiful, and it's going to be perfect. It's not going to be beautiful, and it wasn't beautiful for him, and it wasn't perfect for him, and there's nothing I could do to change that but to mourn with him and be with him. After um, in that, he was in a very weird situation as far as <coughs> housing goes. <clears throat> but um, So we tried to find a home for him, and some of you understand this, but whenever a child is hurt, um, in a home or in any way, and they're in foster care, and you, you have to like let the parent or the family know when they're taking them in all of the things that they've kind of gone through, right? So when we tried to find him his 19th home, we called over 200 homes in the state of California, and every single one of them said no. Every single one of them. Not one person wanted to take a five-year-old little boy who had no major behavior problems because he was damaged, because he was broken, and because it's too hard. That's too hard. Where is the church? Where is our responsibility? Where we have fallen short as a church is that we are not carrying the responsibility of loving and showing compassion to people that this kind of crap is happening in our city and down our street and in our homes and in people sitting right by you because we are lacking the love and compassion because we want to know everything, but we don't want to be tender and loving and compassionate to people. I truly believe that at, at that time, simultaneously, we were starting discovery, and so I said, I'm, I'm out of this. I am, I am not, I, I cannot do this because I'm going to steal kids and take them to Mexico. <laughs> like, for real. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do that. And so I told myself, and I, told, I sat down, Jason, I said, we will not be that church that's just going to have church. We're going to go out to Union. We're going to go find his mom. At first, my, my mission was like, let's go find his mom. Like, I got to go find her. I got to go figure out what happened because she would be the only person who could rescue him. She could be the only person. If she could just pull it together, like, we'll put her in a small group. We'll whatever it takes. Like, you know, uh, take her to tribe. I don't know how old she is. You know, we'll, we'll figure it out. But I couldn't find her. But what I felt like God said was, you're going to find the moms like her. And you're going to find them, those kids, before they end up in that situation. And the church is going to show compassion, and he's going to show love, and that's what's going to save them. And that's what's going to prevent this. And that's what discovery is. That's who we are. That's who we've been and who we will always be. I tell Pastor Clarence all the time, as long as there's breath in my lungs, Pastor Clarence, we're going to be out there. As long as me and Jason are alive, we're going to be out there. We're going to fight for that. We're going to be mad about the social injustice. There was this, like, really cool thing on, um, on the internet that I saw about like what influences social injustice, like what is it that's solving the problem? What is it that is controlling the issues? At the very top of the, of the list was um, the federal government. 
So the federal government, that's kind of like, you know, the welfare system, that's who's taking care of people is the federal government. And then at, at second was um, the state government. So here's the state government, they're, they're helping the injustice, they're doing all these things. And then it was wealthy people. Wealthy people are making a great impact in social injustice is what's happening. And then thank the Lord, right under that was the church. And I wish that we could be at the top, but I was so thankful at least that we were on the, on the map there. Like, my goodness, that's the answer. We're the answer. And we sometimes look, and we can't look at the brokenness, and we can't look at the suffering, and we don't know what to do with it. And so we sit not knowing what to do. And then thirdly here is we don't carry the burden by ourselves. This is how we live with compassion is we don't carry the burden by ourselves. Now, the scripture in Matthew that I'm about to read is, is twofold. There's two things here. So if we d- we, we're looking at their stories, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to um, sorry, we're, we're stepping into someone's story, we're practicing compassion in small doses, and then we're not carrying this burden by ourselves. We're not meant to. We're meant to carry it together as a church, and then we're meant to carry it with Jesus. So in Matthew 11, 28 here says, Are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out on religion, come to me and get away with me, and you will recover your life, and I will show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. So some people want to do the work because that's kind of easier when you put it in this perspective, but then we don't know how to walk with Jesus. So we know how to kind of put in the work. We kind of know how to show up. But the walking with Jesus, so when we leave, we, sometimes when we do hotel outreach, we'll be so consumed by the brokenness that we'll have to have a debriefing when we pray, and we leave it at the feet of Jesus, and we learn that. The second part to this scripture is lean, or sorry, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love this scripture. If I believed in tattoos, I would get one. Learn <laughs> the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and I and you will learn to live freely and lightly. We can look at the hurt. We can look at the suffering and not feel heavy and not feel burdened and not feel hopeless because he's the answer. He's the answer to the hopeless. He's the answer to the suffering. He's the answer to the brokenness. And when we walk with him, we can walk freely and lightly. And then my last point here is we don't walk, um, or how we can walk with compassion is by accepting God's compassion and mercy. So we walk, if we haven't accepted and walk with him, then we can't truly live that out. We can't, we can't understand and fathom even what compassion is if we haven't accepted it ourselves, if it's not something that's, that's in us. So Psalms 103, 10 through 13 says, he, d- he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as, as, high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is, the love, is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God isn't mad. He doesn't see where you've hurt and broken someone or where you are hurt and broken and look at you with anger or push you away or measure you up. He's so in love with you. He has so much compassion for you. And if we can really grab a hold of that and understand that, then the compassion and the love is going to ooze. It's just going to flow out from us. This is one of my favorite, favorite scriptures. You probably will see it on my Instagram for those of you who are. Um, it says, do something for someone who can never repay you. And I kind of live in that mindset in my own life. Like, I want to do something not because someone's going to do something back for me. Like, I'm not going to go do something because I'm expecting something in return. 
But we model this, and I love the concept of doing something for someone who can never repay you because he did it first for us. Jesus did it first for you and for me. He did something that we could never, ever repay him for. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads. And with no one looking around, God, I just pray right now over the brokenness in the room. I pray, Father, over those who are suffering in the room. Lord, those who have been measured up and even told where they fit on some kind of measure of someone's life. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that those words, those measurements would be casted out of their mind, casted out of their thoughts in the name of Jesus. That today there would be a restoration that today there would be a restoration of a filter, the restoration of the lenses, the, the restoration of the perspective, that it would no longer be through hurts and pain and brokenness, but God, it would be through you and your spirit. But also if you're here today and you feel like you don't quite understand the compassion of a father because you haven't put Jesus at the center of your life, I want to give you a moment to consider it. I want to, I want you, I want to plead with you to consider that if you walked in today and you didn't have any plans on surrendering your life to whatever people were going to talk about today, that you walked in not thinking for a second that you needed a Lord or a Savior, that you didn't feel that compassion was something you even wanted in your life. But right now, maybe you're considering it. Maybe right now you're thinking, I need him. I need him now more than ever. I'm going to give you a chance. We're not going to call you up or single you out. Just by a show of hands, I want to pray for you. On the count of three, I am going to just ask you to raise your hands if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, as the person who can make all of the difference. If you're that mom, if you're that dad who was on that point, if you're that kid who was abandoned, or if you were that, that mom who had to let their kid go or might need to let that kid go or whatever it is, wherever you are in your life, and you just need him. And you need something more than yourself. You need to come back. You need to resurrender. You need Jesus. So on the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. We're going to pray together. You can pray in your heart. And Father, we just ask right now that you would come into these broken places, that you would come into the place that, that feels like we can't do it anymore. We don't want to do it anymore. We didn't walk in thinking we were going to do this, but Lord, we're drawn to your hope to your compassion, that you're the father of compassion. And so, God, we surrender our hearts. We surrender our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would come in and be our Lord, be our Savior. Come in and make us new. For those who are surrendering their hearts, Lord, hear their cry, that they need hope, that they need you, Jesus. They need to put you at the center of their life. They're recommitting, they're, they're coming for the first time, whatever it is, and, and come in and be their Lord, their Savior, be their best friend. In Jesus' name, amen.